Um, we are glad to um, have you here for uh, Gertjan Verdict's uh, presentation on his co-author paper, Go Active or Stay Passive, Investment Trust, Financial Innovation and Diversification in Belgium's Early Days. Gertjan is uh, an assistant professor of finance uh, at Catholic University Leuven. Uh, his research interests include asset pricing, economic history, and life insurance. He has published in several leading academic journals, such as the Explorations in Economic History, Journal of Economic History, and Journal of Empirical Finance. Um, so the mechanics for today's discussion will be as follow. Uh, uh, Gerjand will um, uh, have uh, about 30 minutes to make a presentation about his paper. Uh, and then uh, if anyone has any uh, brief question for clarification, uh, you might uh, raise it uh, either in the chat or in the, in the uh, online. Please turn on your camera while you um, uh, make the, the, the question. If you have any any comment or question that is not for clarification, i.e., if it's a if it's a longer comment uh, or or a question that entails uh, a little bit more of response from Gertjen, uh, we ask you that you uh, make it at the end. I will be moderating the queue, uh, and so with no much further ado, I'll I'll give the room to. Uh, Gertjen, uh, thank you, Gertjen. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so oh. much for having me in this interesting. Sorry, uh, sorry. So, yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I forgot to say, everyone, please mute their, their microphones unless they want to make a clarification question, except for Gertjen, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me during this very interesting uh, seminar. So the, the paper I'm going to present to you today is indeed go active or stay passive. Um, investment Trust, Financial History and the Diversification in Belgium's Early Days. So this is a paper co-authored with, with Jan Anaert, who was my PhD supervisor. And I, I really much like this paper because it combines business history with some more quantitative techniques uh, to really try to understand financial innovation. And the financial innovation we are talking about in this paper is the first ever equity investment trust, which was established in Belgium in 1836. So the outline, the agenda for today. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you about the historical perspective. So really the zeitgeist of the, of the moment uh, or why this uh, financial innovation came about, what the idea of in that time um, on Belgium was, why it was so significant, but also why it was not a huge commercial success because as i as i will explain later the mutualité industrielle which was this investment trust was not very commercially successful and in this paper we try to understand why this is actually the case because it has so much appeal as i will explain later um, then very briefly i will go into data and the methodology we use to try to understand the bigger picture here, why this um, investment trust was not a huge success. Then we're going to dive into the actual results, provide some, some additional evidence, some robustness checks to, to our main points, and then I will finally conclude. So first, before we actually dive into, into the paper itself, uh, I wanted to situate this paper in, in larger literature. So there, there are three main topics we see as, um, as our paper contributes to, first, for instance, the, the, the research on investment trust. So there's this important paper by uh, David Chambers and Rui Esteves in the Exploration in Economic History, who talk about the foreign and colonial investment trust. But also have Hudson or Rutherford who tries to say why investment trusts, especially in the 19th century, are very important and very crucial innovations. And this paper actually adds to this. So we want to set the record straight in, in that regard that 
um, the Mutualité Industrielle was the first ever equity investment trust. So it was way before the, the more important foreign, uh, foreign and colonial investment trust. Um, so that's why we try to uh, introduce this in the literature and make people aware that there were some other um, innovations or very interesting innovations happening on continental Europe in the 19th century. Um, also, we touch upon diversification and there, there, from a more finance perspective, you have um, Berger and et al, because I'm not going to try to pronounce uh, his name, but also Goetzmann and Kumar um, with more modern data who, who showed the cost of having an under-diversified portfolio. But you also have uh, the very important work by Jeanette Rutherford in the 19th century, who really showed that people held under-diversified portfolios. So this is going to be our framework we're gonna operate in from the first hand, you have investment trust, then you also have the under diversification aspects, which were highlighted in, in several key papers. Thirdly, we're also gonna add to the historiography of the Brussels Stock Exchange, where for instance, in my PhD, I touched upon these things. For instance, uh, I documented the effect of war risk on a neutral country, Belgium, um, but also Lynch and Mordgat uh, or Jan Aert who, who try to understand why foreign stocks, how foreign stocks behave, why foreign stocks are listed on the Brussels Stock Exchange. So from that perspective, we also add to this literature as well. But now let's dive more into the actual historical perspectives. So the origins of the, the investment trust are very nicely documented by Geert Rauenhorst. And the first ever investment trust was Eendrag Maag Macht. So for those of you who do not really speak Dutch, that's basically the same as their strength in numbers. So this is the first hint of a diversified investment vehicle, um, which Eendrag Maag Macht was mostly into bonds, but still the, the concept of diversification was introduced in 1779. Uh, 1797, sorry, in the Netherlands. Then we have the oldest surviving fund, the Foreign and Colonial Investment Trust from the UK, which was established around the uh, 1860s. And now this paper, we're going to dive into the first ever equity investment trust, Mutualité Industrielle. The actual name is a bit longer, but uh, we're going to call it just Mutualité Industrielle for convenience. So this investment trust was established in 1836 uh, in Belgium. So to give you a really idea of what we are talking about, so I brought you a picture of the number of stocks that were listed on the Brussels Stock Exchange at that time. So we start in uh, 1836 and we end in uh, 1873. Now, why do we end in 1873? because the investment trust was liquidated at that time. It didn't go bankrupt, as I will explain later, but it became an actual department of the Société Générale. But just to give you an idea of how many stocks there were actually listed at the time, it started around 30 and then spiked up to more than 100. So there was a lot of interest in stocks more so than bonds. So bonds were not very, very much featured on the Brussels Stock Exchange at that time. There are some municipal government or corporate bonds, but in way lower numbers than the actual stocks that were listed at that time. So you see already from this graph that there is a lot of supply and demand for equity, both from an investor point of view, but also from a uh, financing point of view. So then became the, so, uh, the Mutuality Industrial. So where did the, this company actually come from? Well, it came from the Société Générale. For those of you who do not know the Société Générale, well, in 1822, King William of the Netherlands created a commercial bank, Société Générale, 
Um, and what they did is they uh, tried to establish a real bank that provided loans, bonds to um, companies, to really establish companies. But there, they, came a lot, they came under a lot of scrutiny uh, a couple of years later. Why? Because when there was a huge crisis, they actually uh, received a lot of equity in the companies they underwrote. So not only were they a commercial bank, they also became uh, an investment bank. So the first ever universal bank was created. And what they did is they got a lot of money from their clients and invested in a lot of companies. So they became very much intertwined with the Belgium economy at that time. They funded so many companies that their power grew, grew and grew some more. They even became as some historians say, way more powerful than the actual Belgian government. So they became, they came under a lot of scrutiny for that point. So they came up with a kind of solution and they created a separate company, the Mutualité Industrielle, which was an investment trust, but they dumped a lot of their own shares in this new fund. So a lot of uh, problems in terms of common ownership were uh, mitigated through this new company. So what was the idea of Mutuality Industrial? Well, if we go to the, um, to the mission statement, well, it says the company's purpose is to present to the investors a placement, a placement of a social capital in a large number of establishments. So in the mission statement at that time, you already see that the idea of diversification was very important because they want to uh, invest in a lot of different um, companies at the same time to protect themselves against potential reverses in one of those establishments. So the idea of diversification was already there. Secondly, what we also see in the mission statement is that they will always invest as much of their capital as possible. So this is very important because this is a time period where trading stocks is a very costly thing. So uh, trading stocks requires a lot of broker fees, a lot of transaction fees. And here you have a vehicle that does diversification as much as possible in a lot of different stocks. This could be very interesting for those investors, especially less wealthy investors, to also benefit from, uh, from the stock market at the time. And that is something we actually see also in the mission statement because they offer, Societe Generale offered customers who had deposit at their commercial bank the possibility to take a, 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 a stock in uh, the Societe Generale and they, they label it as, well, you can <clears throat> buy some equity and invest in the most important industrial associations. So this is something that really highlights why Mutualité was, was, um, was established to actually lure in new kind of investors, less wealthy investors who just deposit their money. And what, what is Societe Generale going to do? Well, they're going to use these deposits they get from these new investors, both wealthy, but also more importantly, those less wealthy investors and use those deposits to actually invest in new companies. So this is a way to attract new funding and also make it to a, a very good use uh, in, the, in the, um, the Belgium economy. So that, this was the main idea. Um, so the appeal, those less wealthy economic agents, so those investors get a real chance to invest their money in a broader stock market. So they do not need to buy or create or manage a portfolio, they can just invest in a new company and they do the diversification for you. Also, interestingly, it was at a very low price. And what do I mean by low price? Well, if we just compare the price <clears throat> of one share of Mutuality Industrial, this was always below the average of uh, just a single stock listed on the Brussels Stock Exchange. So you can buy an entire fund, an entire portfolio of assets at the same price 
or even at a lower price, then you can just buy a regular asset. Also, the stock buying itself was done on a credit basis, meaning that um, Societation et al. offered loans with very small margin requirements for their investors. And also they secured these loans with the actual stock itself. So people were incentivized to actually invest in Mutualité Industrial. And this was very important, especially for those less wealthy investors. They also were given the opportunity to, as, I, as we say it here, to get a cheap way to a diversified portfolio of equities. So as I said before, this was mostly through bonds, but this is the first time they can actually participate for equities as well. So to give you an idea of what's a, what they actually get for their money. Um, so as you can see, um, this is the, the portfolio itself. You have a, a lot of different shares, for instance, in Societation at all, you had normal shares, but also reserve shares. Um, but also uh, Chemin de Fer means railroads. You also had industrial um, companies. And also below, you have some bonds, but they were fairly limited. So what do we learn from just looking at, at this portfolio? Um, it, we see that, well, this um, company is um, invested in a lot of different stocks, not in, not in a lot of different sectors, but they were diversified in terms of a number of different stocks. But the majority of their portfolio is still in the parent company, still in Societation at all. So around 50% of their portfolio is, in is invested in Societation at all, and the rest is diversified among a, a larger number of different stocks. And only a very small segment was uh, done in bonds. So what did you get for your money? As I said, more than 50% is gonna be in Societation at all, which is gonna be important for the, the methodology we're gonna use. Um, they were diversified in terms of stocks, but definitely not in terms of sectors. So railroads and industrial stocks were the most important ones. And sometimes yet a, a few other um, sectors. Also in the later years, there were some foreign stocks as well. Um, which is also going to be very important. But what did you get for your money? Most importantly, they paid a lot of dividends. Those dividends mostly came from Societation at all. Either um, through the dividends Societation at all paid to their investors or they made a homemade dividend by selling Societation at all shares. So to give you some kind of idea, approximately around 5% of dividend yield this stock um, generated each year. So it was a very interesting investment in that regard. So to really put this in, in kind of perspective, how did the, the Mutuality Industrial actually do? Well, we just show you the equally weighted market portfolio. And uh, in orange, we have the Mutuality Industrial. So in the beginning, you'll see that there was a huge crisis, uh, which um, Mutuality Industrial very much suffered. Then in 1850, the National Bank of Belgium was created and this gave a real boost to the economy, which Mutuality Industrial also gladly took advantage of. So you see that with Mutuality Industrial, if you discounted the, the the first number of years, you had a fairly similar return as the market portfolio. Well, you also have Action Reuni, which was the main competitor, which was established two weeks later, which also gives you a fairly similar return. But just to, to highlight this, what did you get for your money? Well, you get a, a return that, that is somewhat similar to the overall market return with a little bit more risk, but still it could be a fairly interesting investment for investors. But then there was a huge problem. And the problem was there wasn't very much enthusiasm from the general public. Um, and the, there was a, a quite a number of reasons for this. First, um, in general, you see that um, innovation was not applauded for. So, um, 
historians at that time really tell us that um, new ventures, new kind of innovations, people were very hesitant to invest their money in these kind of things. But secondly, also the fee structure of mutuality and industrial came under a lot of scrutiny. So uh, there was a lot of fees that were being paid to the, to the portfolio managers themselves, and they were killed in newspapers because of this. So the general public was a bit opposed to uh, th this new venture, mutuality and industrial. But secondly, you also had the government. So in the beginning, the uh, government actually prohibited mutuality and industrial to solicit small investors. So as I explained before, this was their main target group. They wanted to get less wealthy investors also participated in the stock market and the government uh, really prohibited to market those investors. Those investors were still allowed to invest, but they, uh, the funds could not really target them directly. But also the prime minister in the 1850s told a, a newspaper that he did not really understand why people would buy such a, such a fund. Because first he told uh, the newspaper that, well, you can do this yourself. You do not really need mutuality and the sale for having a diversified portfolio. But secondly, he also told uh, the newspaper that um, diversification is an idea that's never going to work because if one stock in the portfolio drops, the entire portfolio is going to drop. Well, with the benefit of hindsight, we know that it's not true, but this really explains the, the mindset of people, especially powerful people at that time, um, what, what was going on there. But still, our research question becomes, why is there no enthusiasm? Um, because as I explained, we are in a time period where there's a lot of uh, transaction costs and broker fees. Why is this not a very interesting um, financial innovation? Why did it actually get liquidated after 37 years? Well, very quickly, I'll go over the data. So the data we are using is from SCOP at the University of Antwerp. So we have all the monthly data on every listed uh, stock. We have data on dividends, number of shares, also corporate uh, actions, stock splits, uh, and all of these things. Also the reason for the listing. Um, as I said, we're gonna focus on common stocks only because we did not really have the data on bonds, but also, um, bonds were, were not very important for mutuality and industrial. It was mostly a stock driven um, enterprise. So that's why we're going to focus on stocks only. So also very quickly on the methodology. So what is our idea? From 1837 until 1873, when this, the, the entire duration of the fund, we're going to create specific portfolios. So each January, we're going to select either one of three different strategies. So first, we're going to select four stocks purely chosen at random. Then we're going to, or sorry, or we're going to select three stocks at random, but we're going to add at least one stock of solicitation at all. And then our third strategy is going to be, we're going to uh, select two stocks randomly, one stock of solicitation at all, and one foreign stock. Why are we doing this? Well, we're trying to replicate their portfolio to a greater extent. So we hold these stocks for an entire year. We're going to calculate the, re the average return. And then next January, we're going to do the same thing. So for 37 years, we're going to uh, create this portfolio strategy and see how did this portfolio strategy actually perform. But not only that, we're going to repeat this 1 million times each year to get a large number of observations, to really get as much possibilities in terms of portfolio selection as possible. Then our result, which is going to be the main thing, we're going to calculate the percentage of portfolio outperforming the mutuality and the surreal, either on a return basis or a risk return basis in terms of sharp ratio. So why do we do this? Well, first, because there's research that shows that people hold only four stocks 
well, stock holdings or, or bonds in their portfolio. So that's why the number four actually comes back quite often in, in the literature. Also, people create equally weighted portfolios, but we have a robustness check for, for other weighting schemes as well. And we focus on an annual horizon since I've shown you that the trust also traded rather frequently. So that's why we, we try to, to capture these things as well. But then again, all of these different things we're going to relax in a robustness check to really show that our, our conclusions do not really depend on those choices we are making right here. So the results. First, we're going to focus on the four stock portfolio. So what do we see? We see that we have a mean return of 8.36%. The standard deviation of the average portfolio is about 23%. If we compare these two, Mutualité Industrielle, they had around 6.72% return with 18.33%. So what does this mean? It means if we only look on purely on a return basis, our synthetic portfolios of randomly selected four stocks, more than 60% of those portfolios outperform the mutuality industrial when we just look at returns. In terms of sharp ratio, so risk return, more than 50% of stocks outperform mutuality industrial. So not very good, not very bad. Um, but what happens if we just focus on three stocks and solicitation at all? Well, you see that the percentage of portfolios outperforming the trust increased significantly, both in terms of returns and in terms of sharp ratio. What if we add a foreign stock? Well, it becomes even bigger. Close to 70% beats the trust based on return and close to 70% base uh, beats the trust based on risk return. So that means the more you're going to replicate a portfolio, the less attractive the trust it becomes. So in that case, we can actually agree with the prime minister at that time that you actually didn't need the mutualité industrial. You can just buy a under-diversified portfolio of four stocks and beat, or most of the time, beat the, um, the trust itself. So this already shows that you did not really need the mutuality and the CDL purely from a return perspective. Now, we're going to present to you some further evidence. And which further evidence? Well, what if we uh, focus on investor wealth and investor sophistication? Investor wealth, meaning we're going to um, limit our search for stocks with low prices, stock with high prices. In terms of sophistication, we're going to focus on lottery stocks. What is a lottery stock? A lottery stock is a stock with a low price, but a very potential high outcome, like winning the lottery. Or we're going to focus on um, some more sophisticated technique, meaning we're going to buy stocks with a very high dividend yield. So stocks that pay a lot of dividends for their price, but also stock that performed very well the, uh, the, last, the previous year. So what is going to happen there? Well, if we focus on the low price stocks or stocks with a very low share denomination, you see that purely from a return perspective, only 35% of those portfolios outperform mutuality industrial. Even if we take risk into account, that number drops to less than 5%. So this means if you are a less wealthy investor, from a purely risk return perspective, you can only beat the trust in 5% of the cases. So for low, uh, less wealthy investors, the trust is a very interesting tool to have. So you see that they actually performed very well in the segment where they wanted to perform very well. Now, what happens if we turn to wealthy investors? Well, you see from a return perspective, it's all, always around the 60% of return uh, of, of portfolios that outperform the trust based on returns. But if we take risk into account, all of the 1 million portfolios in a given year 
beat mutualité industrielle in terms of risk return. So this is, this is a very interesting thing. So this means that the more wealthy investors become and the more they are able to buy um, high price stocks, the less attractive the trust is going to be. So this already shows you that less wealthy investors should buy this trust purely from a return perspective. High, uh, high net wealth investors should uh, leave the stock or leave the trust for what it is. Now, what are we going to see in terms of investor sophistication? Low price, high risk, high skewness. Um, those are also more less wealthy investor uh, techniques, strategies. Again, sharp ratio, risk return below 20%. So this means that less sophisticated investors actually are way better off buying mutuality industrial. Now, high yield, high momentum, or more quantitative techniques, again, outperforms the, the um, mutuality industrial very significantly. So the more sophisticated the investors become, the less attractive the trust becomes. So we have some further evidence, which I'm going to leave for now, but we switched uh, between weighting methods. So we have price and value weighted, uh, not only equally weighted. We focus on different competitors, different weighting schemes. Also, we focus on a more dynamic portfolio strategy, different strategy as well, which I'm going to leave for now. The, the main story still holds. And what is the main story? Well, the main story is the first ever closed and equity trust was established in Belgium in 1836. It was a very appealing for investors on many, many different levels, such as the low price or the secured loans with very small margin requirements, but it never became uh, an important uh, vehicle. It never became a commercial success. Why is that? Well, I showed you that wealthy and sophisticated investors did not really need the, um, the, the, the trust. They were better off with an under-diversified portfolio. Less wealthy and sophisticators, not. But if those less wealthy investors and unsophisticated investors did not really have the capital to invest and to provide a better future for the trust, well, then they really didn't need to be alive anymore. And that's why they became a department of Société General in 30, 18, uh, 73 and got liquidated afterwards. Thank you so much for uh, your attention and I'm very much looking forward to any questions you have. Thank you, Gerjan, uh, for your presentation. Um, so at this moment, I'm going to ask um, uh, if anyone has uh, a question, I'm going to group them in uh, three. Uh, and if you want to either turn on your uh, video or uh, write in the chat uh, whether uh, you want to ask any question. So I think John Handel has one question. I'm going to give the, uh, allow him to, to ask it. Thanks. Oh, thanks. I was um, I was actually just waving hello at Gertjan, <laughs> but I do have a question. Um, so sure. Hi, John. Work out. Um, so I, this is a great paper, and really it seems to me, right, that the, the problem you, you bring up here is that um, wealthy investors who were in the stock market didn't need this investment trust, and it was uh, less wealthy investors who the trust actually would have worked for just simply weren't... Um, uh, simply weren't uh, uh, able to invest in it. So... To me, the sort of next question that you have to answer is why? Why weren't they investing in it? And so is this an issue, do you think, more of politics and the culture of investment at that time? You, you know, the prime minister saying this is a bad idea, et cetera. Or is this actually an issue of, you know, there is just simply not the um, investor or customer base of these people just don't have enough capital to, to put in. And the, the last thing I'll just add, um, it was a really interesting stat, I think you say before, from 1836 to 1838, the deposits at Societe Generale increased from 19 million to 46 million, 
which seems like I, what's, what's driving that? Because if it is small depositors, right, you would think they would be able to channel that into these trusts and things, but maybe it's large depositors. So that was, that was a stat that I thought was interesting. So. So, so thank you for your question. I, I, I think you, 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 asked, you asked the right question. So first, a bit of a disclaimer. So um, we made a lot of assumptions, meaning we do not really know what less wealthy investors actually invest in. So we took a little bit of the, the current finance literature and actually extrapolated that to today. So lottery stocks, for instance, is something that less wealthy investors nowadays invest in. And we try to, to use that idea to, to this paper as well. Similarly, there, there is some, some research um, uh, by, by Janet Rutherford as well that suggests that dividend yield is something very important in the 19th century. So we use their ideas and try to understand um, why that, that could, could happen. So um, that's why... We do not really know. We, we believe that if that is indeed the case, that less wealthy investors invest in low price stocks, then it doesn't really make any, any sense. Um, so uh, we also believe that, yeah, if, if um, the government is really opposed to this, um, based also from, from a, a common ownership perspective. And it was also very much a power, power thing. So the, the manager of Societe Generale became so powerful and so uh, dominant over the Belgium economy that they were a little bit hesitant to give them some, uh, some more power. So if they're, they're hesitant to give them the light of day and to really target these investors, that could put a lot of people off. That, that's the first thing. But um, the second thing as well is you, you read in, in a lot of um, chronicles of historians that um, those investors, but investors in general, were not looking forward to new kind of ventures. So financial innovation in Belgium, but we see this in the Netherlands as well, in, in another paper where they uh, introduced convertible bonds, those financial investments at first were not very welcome. Um, so I think it's a bit of a combination of both. The fact that the government said, well, you should not really uh, market to those investors. And then adding that, hey, if those investors are able to invest in the strategies we believe they're going to invest, they don't have the capital to do so, probably then this will likely lead to, um, to yeah, the, the lack of enthusiasm. So to your other point of the Société Générale, well, you have to remember that at that time, um, Belgium was one of the first countries to, um, to uh, do, go through industrial revolution on the, on the European continent. So there was a lot of money flowing towards Belgium in a lot of different companies. So that actually could lead to a lot of money flowing into Société Générale. They only had one major competitor, Banque de Belgique. Um, so you didn't have a lot of um, options if you wanted to have a stable big bank to put your money in. So uh, I, I don't know the, the specific reason why it was a boom in those years, but I assume with the, the demand uh, and the supply for money that, that actually helped a, a great deal. Um, Very good. So, so I think I, I answered Natalie's question to some extent. Um, so why, why the government didn't allow the direct marketing? Well, we believe it's a power issue. Um, I think that is, that is uh, from, from all the accounts I read, the most likely the case that Societe all became super powerful. So um, they, they wanted to uh, or not allow that at, at any time. Very good. At this moment, I will ask uh, first Jeanette Rutherford and then Paula Vedovelli also have a question. Thank you. Hello, great paper. And it's good to see that Belgium was before England on the investment trust <laughs> front. A um, couple of things. I mean, I think you're being a bit cruel because Société Générale seems to be a lump in the portfolio. And you say it starts off at 50%, and yet you only take a quarter of it when you're comparing. 
Yeah. And that doesn't seem very fair. But I mean, did they change? Did they actually trade the, the Société Générale percentage up and down, or was it just a fixed effect? Because no, you could so divide did, the did, two things and see their performance with and without Société Générale. So they trade it down. So we only have uh, four years of, of the, the portfolio composition. You see them trading it down steadily. Um, mm -hmm. But we also have some robustness checks where we uh, elevate it to 50%. Um, so we, we the same results hold. We just wanted to allow investors more freedom in terms of portfolio selection. If they didn't want so staging at all, well, they could have some other stocks as well. But the same numbers... Uh, are, are equivalent if we put solicitation at all on 50%. Right. If we put yeah. it on 50%, then it makes even less sense to invest in the trust. Okay, and the other thing was transaction costs and leverage. I mean, you say that transaction costs is a benefit, yet you don't put transaction costs in your estimates. That's, that's true, because we do not really have a, a, a fixed number of how much transaction costs there were at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's something we did not really find and we did not really know. Um, okay. But, but then again, I was thinking, uh, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if you want to invest in the, in the fund itself, you also have to pay transaction costs. Obviously, to a lesser extent, because you, you need uh, just one stock compared to four, but still, if you want to trade that trust, you also have to pay something. So that's also not really for free. Yes, but so, you also make the point that they they trade a lot, which I was surprised at because I mean it's in certainly in the UK even with more stocks it was quite difficult to trade some of well certainly bonds in large yeah. amounts even railway stocks were quite illiquid. So, I'm, so what kind of level of turnover were they achieving? Yeah, so we only know it for four years, so that, that is a bit unfortunate. Uh, but we see relative compared to, I know you have a paper on investment trust in uh, Economic yeah. History Review, and there we see it's a bit more turnover than what, what you guys are, are, are reporting. Not like day trading kind of things, especially not. But uh, for instance, Sostation at all, stock, for instance, decreased from 56 to 51%. And also some other assets were bought, bought and sold. Um, uh, most of the time it was the same stock, but you see turnover in those stocks as well. well what's the, quite interesting about you is that you're, you're only looking at equity. So unless the company goes bust or gets merged, they're yeah. there forever. Whereas the British Investment Trust, it was, it was long dated bonds, but they matured and they had yeah. sinking funds. So there was more turnover that was forced upon you yeah. compared to you. Yes, that, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Paula? Thank you, Gertia. And I have several questions. This was a fascinating paper, but I'm going to limit myself to two for now. So the first one is that I was very curious what kind of explains um, the, the difference between, for, for what, let me repose, uh, reframe the question. What would explain this, this difference between uh, the performance for the less wealthy investors and the more like wealthy, sophisticated investors? I'm trying to think, um, uh, thinking here is um, access uh, to information, for example, is um, uh, investment culture is, um, I don't know, what, what, what do you see as explaining this uh, this distinction and the other I, I was wondering if there was some sort of theory of diversification because we know that several decades later we're going to have the geographic uh, theory of diversification with uh, and he Lowenfeld in the financial review of views and there is like a whole theory of why you need to diversify not, not only by sectors but also by countries and you said, oh, they prefer stocks and not bonds. And I, I was wondering if there was like a theory or at least a rationale behind why they did that. So uh, thank you for your questions. So uh, I'll start with the, the last question first. So the main theory in, in finance came in the 1950s. So more than 100 years later on diversification. Uh, uh, Harry Markowitz uh, actually won the Nobel Prize with showing uh, if you add more stocks, then the systematic risk prevails, but the idiosyncratic risk 
So firm specific risk actually goes away. So that is, that is interesting to see that even more than 100 years before, the ideas of diversification were not really formalized mathematically, but people referenced to these things in several different places. So you see in France in the 19th century that diversification is talked about, you see in Belgium, you see in the UK. Um, so that is, that is probably the, the general idea there. Why they choose stocks and not bonds? Probably it's also somewhat of, of a cultural thing, meaning that, uh, as I explained to John, um, the Industrial Revolution sparked a lot of enthusiasm for entrepreneurs. Belgium was not really known for, for one specific thing. So you see that the stock market was very diversified. Tramways, uh, railways, but also industrial companies. So you see there's a lot of possibilities in terms of, of, um, of financing, but also probably what I explained earlier, like the societies in et al. went through a crisis. Uh, they became an, a, a universal bank and they actually took ownership in specific companies. So they actually held equities in companies and then probably sold those equities um, there as well. So that is probably more of a cultural and evolutionary thing, why they have more stocks rather than bonds. To your first question, um, we see that the likelihood of uh, bankruptcy is significantly higher for low price stocks relative to high price stocks. So you see in terms of return, those numbers were rather similar. It is only in terms of risk that the, the, num the, the percentage of risk was way higher for low price stocks. And that possibly can explain first, uh, I think you're, you're correct saying that uh, information was scarce for low price stocks, but I cannot say that indefinitely, but it, that's the feeling I have. But secondly, and more importantly, the likelihood of uh, financial distress bankruptcy was way higher for low price stocks. So probably that can explain the low returns and especially the higher standard deviation, so the higher risk. So I think that that somewhat can explain the, the divergence between those two. Uh, I hope um, that answers your question. Thank you. So um, I don't see anyone in the queue right now. I'm gonna ask uh, to, oh yes, uh, Alejandra Irigoyen has one question and then I'm gonna ask uh, a question of my own. Uh, Alejandra asks, uh, can you please give more details on the governance and management of the institution? Uh, also, can you elaborate more on the internal workings of this as a trust? So the, the as a trust worked very similar to, to Societe Generale. So you see that the, the composition of Societe Generale and the Mutualité Industrielle was rather similar. So in terms of governance, they really followed suit with what Societe Generale did. So they focused on less wealthy investors. They paid dividends almost each year. I think apart from two years, they paid a lot of dividends. So that's what they really tried to do. Um, but you also see that there was some enthusiasm uh, because the liquidity of, of the stock was higher than the liquidity of, of the average um, stock market at that time. So uh, we do not really know specifically what the, the rationale behind specific reasons were other than the mission statement that they wanted to invest in a lot of different companies at the same time. And they try to attract new funds. So either they or Societation at all could invest in new companies. So that, that was the, the key idea um, that, that the, the trust had in mind. They want to create and really finance Bel the Belgium economy at that time. I, I hope that answers the question. Um, if I have a follow-up from Alejandra, I, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you know. So okay. uh, I have a very brief question and uh, it has to do with the kind of exposure that the investment trust had uh, regarding uh, foreign stocks. Okay. So uh, it, what kind of exposure was this? Was this uh, to 
uh, companies operating in, in European colonies in, in Africa and Asia? Is this uh, uh, stocks in, in the new Europe? Is this in Latin America or developing countries? So uh, the, the percentage of foreign stock is very, very small. So that's, that's the first thing. So it's one or two companies, uh, which we know of. Um, so I know there's uh, one, um, one canal, for instance, between, Amster, uh, between Rotterdam and Antwerp, which was financed or uh, financed by or Mutualité and Surreal had it in their portfolio. So it seems that it's still uh, uh, companies that are close to Belgium or have activities in Belgium as well. So it doesn't really seem stocks uh, to be stocks in Africa. Also, Congo was not uh, not a colony at that time. It was only in, in the end of the, the 19th century that uh, Congo really became uh, um, a force on the Belgian stock exchange there as well. So there weren't that many uh, foreign stock listings in Brussels in general and not so much in the... Um, the, the mutuality industrial was very, very small. Um, I also very see good. there's there's a question by, by Sergio. Uh, was yes. there an important increase in the level of indebtedness credit bubble of less wealthy households? So that, that is a bit of a problem. Um, so I try to, to really go to archives and try to see what portfolios investors had. So I know uh, Jeanette Rutherford has a very interesting paper who shows in the UK what, what kind of, of uh, portfolios those households have. We do not have that information. So we, we just hypothesize what investors could have had in their portfolio. Uh, and we make a lot of assumptions, um, but we can only make, make assumptions. Um, so, so I, I do not really know the answer to, to that question. Um, I, I see Frederick is raising their, his hands. Yes, please go ahead, Frederick. And then yeah. John Handel wrote something. Hi, Gertjan. Um, I, I have a, actually a, one question that goes in the same direction as what you already talked about, uh, or what you just said, and, and why four stocks? Uh, I, because I, when I read your paper, I, I saw that you relate uh, to, to Jeanette Rutherford's work. Um, and um, so my question was, was just would be like, how does the Belgian case relate to the UK case? But you basically yeah, so, answered this. So that's something we do not know. So that's yeah. why you see in Goetzmann and Kumar, for instance, nowadays it's also around four stocks. So we just extrapolate that probably it's going to be similar in Belgium. But okay. in the appendix, and we show like if we go from two to 10 stocks, what happens? And the picture becomes even worse for the mutuality industry if we increase the number of stocks. Then the, the percentage of portfolios outperform increase. So that's why we believe if they followed um, the, their British counterparts or their American counterparts, they... they uh, have a we have somewhat of more comparison base uh, in in that regard. So that's why four. Okay, great. Because I also the second part of the question would have been what what changes if there's only two stocks or ten in the portfolio. But that's basically also the numbers you had. Um, mm -hmm. Then the other question would be uh, or two short other questions. What was actually the empirical reason uh, for the liquidation of the fund in in uh, 1873? Because in the paper, you mentioned something that it was not fulfilling the expectations, but were they adding to this uh, or do you, do you know it? Um, so at that time, uh, limited liability companies were only established for a, a specific number of years. So 5, 10, 15, 30, and then they had to be renewed. So we think given that uh, 1873 is also the year where uh, limited liability regulation was introduced that that's at the same time simultaneously was also with the liquidation of of, uh, of mutuality industrial but also adding to that there was a, a important financial crisis at that time so I think those two reasons 
combined, given with the lack of enthusiasm, it, be, it, it became a department of Société Générale. So it did not go bankrupt. It just became a, a, a separate department in, in the company itself. Mm. So, um, and just, just one, one short uh, last question. Um, so if, if I understood you correctly, the conclusion is more or less that there were better alternatives for a certain uh, group of people with a certain wealth. So um, was this also, again, a more an empirical question, was this discussed in newspapers? Um, do you, did you like double check it with the narratives in, in the newspapers about this stock? And, and uh, so just also, oh. yeah. No, no, we didn't. Um, so we didn't, we didn't check uh, because I, I tried, but I couldn't get. So at that time, there were a lot of newspapers with financial advice, but I couldn't get my hands uh, on this. Um, but what our idea was is you see a lot of papers that show that, hey, people hold an under diversified portfolios. Our reason was like, maybe there's a rational, rational reason why they do so. And we show that in specific cases, it does make sense to hold an under, under diversified portfolio. So that, that was also our idea like, hey, why do people do this? Well, if they choose specific portfolios, they have a very nice return compared to a period where you didn't have much alternatives in terms of, of trust. So that's that combination was also indeed the, the idea of um, our paper. Thanks. Thank you for your questions. So the last question goes to Dan Du. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, well-organized presentation and a very sophisticated, sophisticated analysis. Actually, my question is kind of related to uh, Frederick's question. I think you, maybe you already covered it. I just want to know the public understanding of, of this investment, especially the less wealthy and unsophisticated. Um, investors, did they really have an understanding of the sophisticated analysis that you just made? Well, did their like, uh, maybe not so well, how to say, uh, their lack of understanding contributed to the liquidation? Thank you for your question. So um, I'm, I'm gonna answer your, your question in, in twofold. So first, did they understand the sophistication of the trust? I, I do not think so. They understood really what the trust was about because the prime minister really told the, the newspaper um, that, well, diversification is, is basically overrated because if one stock in your portfolio drops, everything drops. Well, that is not true. So if a very wealthy and, and a powerful person already says something, I can assume that a lot of less wealthy investors just follow his advice and, and tell, well, it, well, we don't want anything to do with, with this. But the second part of your answer, well, I, I totally understand that we made a lot of assumptions, meaning that dividend yield and momentum stocks, especially momentum, was it understood at that time? Probably not in the ways we understand it nowadays. However, I believe that the strategies we use are very appealing, meaning if you have two different newspapers, and you see a stock going up in one newspaper, you see the stock going up next week as well, well, probably you're very motivated to buy that stock because A, it can only go up. So you don't really need a lot of financial knowledge to see stock prices going up. Hey, you, maybe you want to be a part of that as well. From a dividend yield perspective, there is some research in the, in the UK that shows that um, Dividend yield, so the amount of dividends company pay, actually represent corporate governance and can be very appealing to investors. There is also something you can see. Well, if you buy this stock and this company pays a lot of dividends, well, this arguably is going to be a very interesting stock. So you do not really need to do valuation models. You can just look at a newspaper and just purely intuitively invest in, in those strategies. That's why we didn't add other fancy volatility type of, of things, because to us, these things make a lot of sense. Similarly, 
um, let's say you are a, a less wealthy investor, so you, you, you only have so much money you can invest in. Well, what are you going to look at? Low price stocks. So again, you do not really need an economic theory or an economic rationale, it's just a budget constraint. So that is also the reason why we, we went for, for this type of analysis, just because we didn't want to complicate it too much. We just want to have purely um, intuitive measures of whether or not you can choose a stock. Not a really complicated model, not just the amount of dividends they, they paid, the price, and past performance. That was, that was our, our basic idea. But do we know that people actually did this? Unfortunately, we, we don't. That's why I said we make a lot of assumptions. I think they're educated assumptions given what other countries did and what other people wrote, but still we, we make a lot of assumptions in that regard. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um. Thank you everyone for participating and of course to Gerjan for this incredible presentation. Uh, I want to uh, let, you, uh, let you all know that uh, our next event will be a keynote talk by Professor Richard Silla from New York University on the topic of uh, whether modern economic growth was finance led and you can see the link to the session and the registration page in our chat. And uh, please join me in saying thanks to Gerjan for his presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Gerjan. Thank you.